we're going to try to inspire you just a little bit more. If you need any more inspiration now, uh, I don't think so. But we're going to inspire you in a different way because there's a lot of things that are important about this. And it's not just the, the different uh, companies and the different corporations that we have that are incredibly important, but it's also the possibilities that start in the little small cooperation between people and end up being something really, really huge and life-changing. And that's just the way that society works and that's the way it's supposed to work. And we're in an age now where there's incredibly exciting things happening and we have an inspirational talker with us here today who has a very, very interesting background. There's a lot of knowledge here that we'd love to hear a little bit more about because you might recognize this guy as he appears on TV frequently. I'm just talking about science stuff, like kind of a dream job. But I happen to know he also started off in the underground music industry. And people who were really into that in the 90s might have actually met you there as well, Akka. Uh, now he's a scientist, well, and he's a lecturer. And today, you, exactly, you're going to entertain us with the digital world in some way. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, a big thank you to the East Sweden Hack team for inviting me here today. Uh, this is cutting edge technology, the Internet of Things, and what you guys are doing as a community is going to have a huge impact, not for just the future of this area, I think, but whole of Sweden. So congratulations for putting this together for many years now, and I hope it continues for a long time to come. And I'm going to be here today to paint the bigger picture of the Internet of Things for you guys. And I'm going to, first of all, make all of you who are involved in this, either as financial supporters or supporting facilities or organizing everything, to really feel that what you're doing is actually contributing to the cutting edge of Sweden. But I'm also here to convince those of you who still haven't figured out if you're going to join the hack, my goal is to make all of you who are still thinking about it to go home today and say, hell yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. So we're going to talk about things in three parts. First, I'm going to introduce you to something I call the sandbox principle. Then we're going to navigate ourselves through the world of technology because I want us to understand how we got here in terms of technology. And once we have done that, we will be able to look forwards a little bit into the future. Because what this hackathon is about is, I believe, working with things that aren't there yet, but it's going to be. So we're going to work with the future, everything that has to do with this hackathon. So we're going to have a little peek into the future. So let me introduce you to the sandbox principle and also give you a brief intro to why I do the things I do and why I care about the Internet of Things and the East Sweden hack. So the sandbox principle basically revolves around the following, that a gardener doesn't build flowers, right? A gardener just sets the conditions there, and then nature will do its thing, right? You don't build a flower, you don't tell nature how to build a flower. You just create the conditions, and you step out of the way, and amazing things will happen. So let me show you what I mean. When I was a kid, when I was around 15 years old, I was a middle class kid living in the suburbs of Stockholm, you know, and I wanted to be a music producer. That was a dream since childhood. But to become a music producer back then in the 90s, you needed this stuff, right? An expensive studio, hundreds of thousands of crowns to buy that, money that we didn't have. But thanks to technology, and the computer revolution, something amazing happened. A Swedish company shows up and they introduce a software called Reason. And they said, with Reason, you don't need that expensive studio anymore. Because all of the stuff that you could buy for your studio, you can now have them on your computer screen. Right? This is a tiny sandbox created for music. They just created an environment which let you just put in stuff in there and connect them how you want and create noises and sound with it. So I went crazy. I got the software, spent day and night with it, and after a year or so, I actually figured out how to use it as a professional. And when I listened to my music, 
it sounded just as good as the stuff on the radio. That's how good this software was, this tiny little sandbox of music, which allowed me to do whatever I want with it. So I had a new goal. Now I didn't need the studio anymore. Technology allowed me to bypass that whole thing, right? With almost no money. My next goal was to end up here, in the record stores. Because when I was a kid, this was the way you purchased music, right? You bought physical CDs. But then another problem came. To get there, you had to get past the gatekeepers, the people who decided who gets to be sold in a record store. And to get past them, you needed to be a powerful person. You needed to have contacts, you needed to know people. I didn't know anyone. I was a middle class kid in the suburb of Stockholm. So then another amazing thing happened. Another sandbox appeared. The first program that lets you, I guess illegally, download and share MP3 files, music files, right? And I had broadband internet, so my computer was on 24 seven. I downloaded music illegally from people, people downloaded music illegally from my computer. But this was also a sandbox because they only set a couple of rules. You can share MP3 files with this program. That's the only rule they set. They didn't say that you have to share music or that you have to share music just as they sell them in the stores. So I thought, if people come to my computer to download famous music, what if I just take a famous album and take two of my own tracks and just squeeze them into that album and Photoshop the album cover so it looks like I'm supposed to be on that CD? Right? That's what the sandbox allowed me to do. And as you know it, a couple of months later, when I searched for my own name on Napster, it was all over the place. People had downloaded my music without knowing it, without even wanting it. But that didn't matter because they liked it, right? So people started discussing on forums, like, who is this guy? Why is the CD different in the store? There are two tracks on it. When I downloaded it, they didn't understand. But with this little hack, just by using a tiny sandbox for music sharing, you know, one thing led to another and this landed me record deals and I got to be a professional musician. With no money, with no contacts, nothing, just by using the internet, which is the biggest sandbox of them all, right? Anyone can do whatever they want on the internet. And using two tiny sandboxes for music and music sharing. So this was 15 years ago. This is what I could do 15 years ago. So imagine what all of you can do today. Let me show you what I mean. So let's navigate the world of technology to figure out, okay, what's happened in the last 15 years? This is in the 1950s, a five, five megabyte hard drive. You could fit maybe one MP3 song on it, right? 1950s, being shipped by IBM to somewhere in the US. Today, you can have 128 gigabytes fit on a chip that's as small as your thumbnail. Right? Another way to put it is, since the 50s, computers have become a thousand times cheaper, a thousand times faster, and a thousand times smaller. That's a billionfold progress. So computers have become a billion times better just since the 1950s. And this is not some chaotic thing that's just happening. Actually, there's a really beautiful pattern to it. And it's something called Moore's Law. This is figured out by Gordon Moore, who was one of the co-founders of Intel. And he saw that if you plot the number of transistors that you can squeeze into a microchip, which basically defines how powerful the chip is gonna be, if you make a plot of that over years, you're gonna get this nice exponential graph. And what's nice about exponential graphs is that one, things get better faster and faster all the time, right? But you can apply a simple mathematical trick called the logarithm. If you do that, the same data looks like this. It's the same data, but it looks like this. Which means that now, you can actually, with relatively good precision, predict how good computers are gonna be in the future. So since the 70s, we've known how good computers are gonna to become today. And we know roughly how good they're gonna be in 20 years from now. And the same goes for the price of computers. We know that they're gonna become cheaper and cheaper all the time, faster and faster. And since every other technology revolves around computers, 
they are going to benefit from the same effect as well. In the 70s, the details you could see from a brain scan was like big chunky pixels of centimeters. Today you can see details of the brain at the nanoscale. The same goes for the price of biotechnology, the cost of sequencing your DNA is becoming cheaper and cheaper all the time. Same with LED lightning and almost every other technology that you can think of. So every technology we know, almost everyone, is becoming better and better, faster and faster all the time. And I know it's kind of hard to grasp how fast things are going, so let me demonstrate that. University of Tokyo demonstrate their new e-skin display. Really thin displays that use OLED technology so you can use your own skin as the display medium. John Hopkins University, they demonstrate using a robot that performs surgery and mends together tubular structures like veins or intestines and it outperforms human skills. Columbia University have developed a new chip that makes Wi-Fi technology twice as fast as it is today and makes it twice smaller than it is today. IBM just released an open platform on the web for their quantum computing technology. So now for the first time you can go online and do quantum computing with a web browser. And University of Washington showed their new hand robot, which is almost as dexterous as the human hand. All of these movements just took 2.4 seconds. And it can do movements that we humans do with our hands. And they didn't have to program every specific situation because they used machine learning. So the robot learns faster and faster about its environment and how to react. Now, all the things I just showed you, I'm sure that all of you agree that they're absolutely amazing. But what is even more amazing is the fact that everything I just showed you are news clips from the last nine days. This is just what's been happening in technology the last nine days. That's how fast everything is going forwards. So if I was born 100 years ago, maybe I would be alive when they invented the telephone. But I would be probably dead by the time something else amazing happened, right? An entire lifetime, a telephone. The old telephone with the <laughs> circle thing, right? But now in nine days, look at what we have. So let's peek into the future. Because this fast advancement of technology is going to affect us in many ways as humans. So what does this all mean? Well, many things, but they can all be gathered into something called disruption, right? When a technology comes along and turns something we were used to upside down overnight, like the music industry, right? Everyone was buying CDs and all of a sudden Napster comes along, turns everything upside down, CDs are gone, everything goes digital, right? So let me show you a couple of disruptions that we have ahead of us. One of them is in behavior, right? So in the 50s, most people were normal, right? Most people were normal, and then you had some weirdos on the outsides of society. You had some weirdos, anarchists, rockabillies, whatever, right? But as globalism became more prominent, we started to buy magazines from other countries, watching movies, learning about other people. The amount of normal people started to shrink because when people here realize that, oh, look at those cool hippies in the US, we're going to be like them and the other way around. So now you have computer nerds, punk rockers, and so on. But today with the internet, everyone on the planet is connected. And for the first time, we have reached a phase where the chunk of normal people, they are actually the minority now. Now everyone is a weirdo in one way or another because we are inherently weird but we didn't dare to talk about it before, but now we can just go online and find another weirdo somewhere else, and we can become friends, and we can create a community. Right? That's why we have people who love baking sourdough bread, that's a community, people who develop apps, people who love beards, like me. I go online, we talk about beards, you know how many people <laughs> we love. 
Twitter pros, diet freaks, organic foodies, and so on. So being normal is not normal anymore. And this has huge implications for us. Because before, you could only become successful if you created a hit. Didn't matter if you were in the music business, you had to create a hit. If you were de developing computers, you had to become a hit. Otherwise, you would die and disappear. But not anymore, because we can find all the weirdos. So if there's something you like, chances are somebody else is gonna like it too. And you can make a community or a business out of it. And this is what's called the long tail economy. There is something for everyone out there. So when you have an idea and you think, ah, oh, there's not probably that many people who are gonna have this idea. That's not true anymore. Chances are there's gonna be thousands, tens of thousands of other people around the world who want the same idea that you're thinking about. If you don't believe me, let me show you some examples. This is a company that specializes in pens. It's like an Apple store, but just for pens. That's the only thing they sell. They sell pens for people who like to write fast, people who like to write slow, people who write poems, there's a special pen for that, people who draw manga, and so on and so forth. There's a store called Frenchy Wear. They sell sweatshirts for French bulldogs. That's how niche they are. And they have a lot of customers. There are thousands of other examples. This is a website that reviews carpets in airports. <laughs> Apparently there's thousands of people who are fascinated about carpets in airports. So there's a community for that too. In fact, the carpet at Portland Airport has its own Facebook page with 14,000 fans. <laughs> so next time you have an idea and you think, ah, nobody's probably gonna like it, that's not true. If you're interested about this, I would recommend reading Tribes by Seth Godin or The Long Tail by Chris Anderson if you wanna dwell down into human behavior in the digital age. So digital, is turning everything upside down, right? We can reach anyone we want on the planet discussing the weirdest things and sharing the weirdest ideas and people are gonna join together in these weirdness, right? But we're also gonna see big disruptions in things we thought never gonna change. One of them is labor. With robotics developing as fast as it is, we now have robots that can perform human tasks, if not equally good, sometimes even better than human beings. And they're not programmed to do specific tasks, they use machine learning, they have a goal, and if there's an obstacle in front of them, they figure out a way to solve the problem, right? For example, Hilton has teamed up with IBM to create a concierge that works at the front desk and you can approach it and talk to it and ask for tips about restaurants or have it book tickets for you for an event. So labor is becoming digital which means that it's become information, which means that we can track it, we can follow it, and we can make it do things we were never able before. Same thing with transportations. We're seeing, this was science fiction five years ago. Now we have Google creating a self-driving car that's gonna put to market within a couple of years. It's gonna be self-driving, it doesn't even have a steering wheel but it's gonna be digital, it's gonna be connected to the internet. You're gonna be able to track it and you're gonna be able to send it instructions from wherever you are. Mercedes-Benz is working on the same thing, Tesla is working on it, Volvo is working on it. This is gonna happen within a couple of years, in our lifetime, cars that drive them themselves. We're gonna see a disruption in medicine and healthcare. A lot of things that humans used to do are gonna be replaced by robots. So even healthcare and medicine is gonna become 100% digital in many ways. This is Reba, the nursing robot, that does the tasks, the tedious tasks of a nurse. The XPRIZE Foundation, if you haven't heard about them, they create huge competitions with huge prices in the range of $10 million to solve extremely complex problems. They had one competition where the goal was to create a vehicle that can go to space, come back, and be able to send back to space within two weeks. And the winning team not only won the $10 million, but they were purchased by Virgin Galactic. And now space tourism is becoming a real thing, thanks to this organization. And now they have a new competition going on where the goal is to create a device that can diagnose the 18 most common 
diseases that we humans get. So that anyone without any skills in medicine can with a tiny device, without putting anything in your body, diagnose yourself. This is going to change everything we thought about medicine and going to the doctor. We're going to see a disruption in data and knowledge. My favorite example is IBM Watson, a supercomputer they created to understand human language. Not like Siri on the iPhone, but I mean really understand human language. So to show the world how awesome it is, they uploaded everything on Wikipedia to the supercomputer. And they sent it to the TV show Jeopardy and let it compete against the two human champions at the time. We'd like to show you a quick video clip to see how that went. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? Right. Let's get right into the Jeopardy round. These categories, a man, a plane, a canal, eerie, chicks dig me, children's book titles, my Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please. Me. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Old Dubai Gorge in 1959, she and Hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus boisei skull. Watson, who is Mary Leakey. You're right. 800, same category. Harriet Boyd Hawes was the first woman to discover and excavate a Minoan settlement on this island. Watson. What is creeped? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. <laughs> and these are the results after the first day of competition. And for the first time in history, a computer has beaten us humans at what we call knowledge. The thing we spent 12 years at school learning, right? So, they didn't build Watson to compete on TV shows because afterwards they installed Watson at hospitals and they uploaded everything we know about medicine and today Watson is better than human doctors at diagnosing cancer. They're training Watson to become a customer service agent and best of all, they are sandboxing the whole thing. They put out the entire platform on the cloud so that every programmer, every enthusiast of artificial intelligence can log on to the platform and use Watson in their apps. And it costs literally nothing. Talk about sandboxing something huge. So we've reached a time where knowledge is for free now. And when knowledge is for free, only your ideas are going to be worth paying for. Because computers can do the knowledge part for us much better and much faster. And this is where all of you come in. Because we need your ideas now more than we have ever needed them before. And that's because of the last disruption we're going to talk about. And that's the disruption in communication. This is what Neil Grosset called, in the next century, planet Earth will don an electric skin. It will use the internet as a scaffold to support and transmit its sensations. And he was spot on. Because this is the trend that we're seeing. Today we have 15 billion devices connected. Smartphones, laptops, gaming consoles. But in just around 10 years from now, these devices are going to be around 50 billion of them. So this is a hackathon about the Internet of Things. And just before I'm going to leave you guys, this is the first time I even used the name. Hmm. And that's because I think this name is a little bit misleading. And it makes us blind for all the possibilities that's here. That's why I call it just a disruption of communication. Not as sexy as Internet of Things, but let me show you why. Because these are the products we've seen so far from Internet of Things. When people think about things connected to the Internet. We have a stove that's connected to the Internet with an Android display. Didn't go so well, because you don't need your stove to be connected to the Internet. There's a refrigerator connected to the Internet with a quick button for ordering mayonnaise. I don't know how useful that is. 
But if we look at it as a disruption in communication, I think things become much more clear. And that's when we realize the potential in this technology. So when we see it as a disruption in communication, this is how the world would look like instead. We will put sensors, because they're so small and cheap now, so we're going to be able to put them everywhere. We're going to put sensors in our oceans and seas and lakes so we can monitor the water quality, we can monitor our parking spaces, we can locate our items, we can diagnose our cars, manage waste. We can put sensors so that we can create maps for urban noise. We can do smart lightning, smart roads, monitor traffic congestion, and so on and so forth. We can put this everywhere in our society. We can monitor air pollution. We can enhance wine quality or our farm quality. We can detect forest fires. We can monitor the health of our buildings and structures. But the interesting part is not what we connect to the internet. The interesting part is what happens when all of these things start to talk with each other, right? Yes, I can connect the lights to the internet. That's not hard, even I can do it. But what happens if I'm walking on the street and I get robbed and I call the police and the lights on that street automatically change color to red so that everyone who's walking nearby see, oh, the colors change to red on that street, something dangerous is happening there, right? That's things talking to each other. That's the potential you get. If I'm in an accident, what if all the street lights and street signs change their directions so all the cars leave empty space for the ambulance, so the ambulance can reach me, who's been in an accident, much faster than before. That's what happens when you, things start talking to each other. That's why, why I want to call it disruption in communication. It's a new way for things to communicate with each other. So this is how the sandbox should look like. This is the next sandbox that's waiting to happen. Internet is the basic sandbox. And this is going to be a new sandbox on top of the internet. But until all of this data is available for everyone, I don't think a revolution is going to happen. That's why I'm so happy to see the partners of East Sweden Hack is putting their data out there because they figured it out. The crowd can come up with much better ideas of what to do with this data than we can alone. And for those of you we're thinking about joining this, but thinking, you know, no, you know, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a hacker, I shouldn't be in this competition. Before I go off the stage, let me just show you what you can do with things like the Arduino or the Little Bits, right? This is technology that people use in elementary school all the way up to university level. So it's so easy to use that 10-year-olds can figure it out, but it's still so much filled with potential that they use it at university labs to develop high-tech stuff. I used it at university too when I was doing science. And you can connect accelerometers, sensors, gas sensors, GPS modules, anything you can think of, there's a sensor for that. So people have used this sandbox to build crazy things we couldn't imagine before. One of them is called botanicals. It's a device you put in your flower and it monitors water and sunlight for your flower and it creates a Twitter account for your flower. So you can follow your flower on Twitter, and when it gets thirsty, it sends you a tweet, right? Another one is called Alarma Sismos. It's a Twitter account that's connected to an earthquake detector. And when you follow this account, you will be notified when there's an earthquake in your city. Built by a 14-year-old dude in Chile. And this solution was much better than the Chilean government's million-dollar project. And the Arduino comes in different shapes. You can put it into clothes, and people have done crazy things with it. For example, in this project, they built a satellite using the Arduino. And then they sent it up to space with a Japanese rocket a year ago. And today, this little thing that costs 200 crowns on Shell & Company <laughs> is spinning around the planet and doing experiments, gathering data for us. That's how powerful it is. How am I on time? Do you have a couple of more minutes? Should I wrap it up? Wrap it up? Cool. <laughs> so, before I leave, let me just show you how simple this is. I was invited to do a talk, and they said, oh, 
Can you tell the audience how easy it is to program as well when you're doing the talk? I said, okay, sure, I will do that. But then I realized I don't know how to program because I've never done it before. And then I thought, oh yeah, that Arduino thing, maybe I should try it out, maybe that could save, save me, you know, save my reputation. So I bought the thing, I bought a starter kit for a couple of hundred kuna, and I started playing around with it. And after a while, I got the hang of it, you know, how to make lights blink and stuff. And then I got an idea. I do a lot of talks. Can I replace this thing in my hand with something that makes me go hands-free? I got that idea from playing around with this thing. So I bought a Bluetooth chip, an accelerometer, and I put everything into this band, and I connected it to the Arduino. And by touching my hand, I could make my slides go forwards and backwards. And I went online, tried to figure out how to program the damn thing. And after two weeks, I was writing code. I've never written code in my life before I did this. And the thing was ugly, and I really wanted to sell it because I thought there's a lot of people who are gonna buy this. They don't wanna hold this thing in their hand. They want something more nice and clean. So I went online and learned how to do 3D design from a 17-year-old kid in Brazil on YouTube. And I figured out the program and I designed a wearable called the Flipper. And you put it on your wrist and you touch it and your presentation goes forwards and backwards. Two weeks of playing with this thing from Shell and Company. I started solving problems and creating innovation. So that's how easy it is to play with technology. And to wrap it up, as Joachim Jordanberg said, something interesting happens to how we perceive problems once we have the attitude, tools, and raw materials to solve them. And East Sweden Hack is providing all of that to you. When you join here as a hacker, you're gonna get the raw materials, you're gonna get the attitude, and all the tools. And they're so easy to use that anyone, regardless of your previous experience, are gonna be able to tackle some really big problems. So this sandbox is just the beginning. And the partners here have offered their open data which you can play around with. And I think what you guys are gonna do at East Sweden Hack is gonna be the first step to make this sandbox as big and as impactful as the internet, of thing, as the internet is today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's incredibly inspiring, and it's so good to see so many great ideas as well. But that's one of those things that you really, really makes you think, doesn't it? Because what is it we're actually providing for the people who are supposed to do these things, create these things? What do we need to do to make sure that we are the idea makers? in Sweden and in this part of the world in the future. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I have uh, sorry. I, I think, I mean, to make this sandbox real, I think all the people who are sitting on this important data, governments, companies, they have to realize that nothing is gonna happen if you're gonna keep everything a secret, right? If your business model revolves around keeping stuff secret, your business model is gonna go broken anyway because everything is going digital. It's not gonna work. You're gonna die within five, 10 years. Instead, if you open things up, like Tesla did, they just released all the patents for their cars, right? Of course, they kept the patent for the battery because that's what people have to buy in order to run the car. But if you open up as much as possible and let the crowd figure things out, I think that's what's needed in order to make this happen. So that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that we have the tools for the people to come up with yeah, the idea. and the data. And yeah, this and is a great data. first step. Do we have any questions in the audience? Very quiet people in the audience. No, well, thank you. You're gonna stick thank around you. as yeah. well. And we okay, obviously no. love to see you for East Street and Hack, because I'm sure you'd be very curious to see what Absolutely. you come up with as well. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.